is leading a project called Time Capsule to Mars, which is a, a student-led mission. And there's a nice connection between the two of you, even though you're not uh, Professor Sapiro's student. Uh, Guillermo's uh, technology for video compression is what's used in transmitting video images from the Mars rover on Mars now. Isn't that, isn't that right? Cool. So we have a, a double Mars connection here in, in the Pratt School. Uh, so, so, so Emily, this is, it's, it's been said before, I think it was Terry Sanford, I think maybe said it, at least attributed to him, that uh, Duke is a place of outrageous ambition. And certainly this notion of a student-led mission to Mars fits that category pretty well. How, how, does it, how does an idea as grand and bold as this uh, come to be? How did, how, did, how did this come about? How did you get interested in it, and, and why Mars? Yeah, okay, so I've always been interested in space growing up. Um, my mom and my dad, who are in the audience now, my mom's a scientist, so she was always getting us engaged in lots of science projects, and my dad was always encouraging us to not just see a problem, but come up with a solution for it. So I always kind of had that mentality, and that's what really drew me to Duke, was when we visited the engineering school, we heard these talks about how it's not just an engineering program. You know, you're engaged with different categories of research, mm -hmm. and it's that's what you need to be successful. So mm -hmm. this idea came about when we were at a conference, uh, myself, my father, and some other students in the field, and we noticed some interdisciplinary problems in the field of space exploration. So it's, we noticed, first of all, there's all this really cool technology that's not getting tested in space because it's too expensive to test on a grand scale. We looked around the room and we noticed there are barely any students engaged in this field because there's no hands-on projects for students to be working on. Right. And we just saw, in general, a lack of excitement about space and why exploration is important. And so. With all those things in mind, we took on the ambitious task of seeking to send a time capsule on a CubeSat, so a really miniaturized spacecraft to Mars. And honestly, it just took a lot of passion from the students involved. We brought on student teams at Duke. Duke mm -hmm. is kind of the hub because we have the student leadership team and the business school, which mm -hmm. is a lot of that mm -hmm. connection there. And then at MIT, Georgia Tech, Stanford, CU Boulder, and U the University of Connecticut. So we have a subsystem lead at each team. and. It's just taking the excitement to I just get have there. To, I have to interrupt for just a second. Not just a business school, but the number one business school in the country. Did you guys notice that? <laughs> How about let's give, our, give Fuqua and our friends at Bill Boulding and Fuqua School a big hand. Yes. Okay. So not to, not to interrupt you, yeah. but it was all those connections that, that yes. brought it here. Okay. So, um, so what is the plan then? There's a window for, for getting this launch? I mean, I, I guess you still have to, to um, swing off of the planets and, and do all of the kind of rocket science that goes into this. So, yes. so <laughs> she really is a rocket scientist. Okay. So, uh, so what is the plan and when will it happen and how much is it going to cost and how are you going to do that? Yeah. So it, the price tag right now is set at $25 million. We've already raised a million dollars of that, which we put towards two full-time graduate scholarships, one at MIT and one at Georgia Tech, to be working on two of our technologies that we're developing. We can la we're launching on a launch in the next five years. We can't disclose the date because people in this audience are smart and would figure out our launch provider, and that can't be disclosed without uh -huh. NDA. But it will be uh -huh. in the next five years, and depending on how much propulsion we decide to add, we'll change how fast we get there, but we're going to be testing this revolutionary ion electrospray propulsion technology that basically is complete opposite of how NASA missions usually work with a huge thrust and coasting. We're going to be throwing out um, ionized particles out the back wow. for really, really tiny momentum boosts, but over our mm -hmm. entire mission, so gaining a velocity where we end up impacting Mars at about six kilometers per second, which is pretty fast. Yep, yep. So you're piggybacking on someone else's launch, so uh, you've had to, to draw a lot of support. This is very different from the 1960s. The Apollo mission captured the imagination of millions of people, but it was an effort led by a superpower. This is, this is an effort not even led by a government. This is not even privatization of space, but really the studentization of space. So, so what is the difference between, in terms of the challenges for, say, an Apollo-type program like that and w in the 1960s and something at this period of time that's student-led? Yeah, and it is student-led, but at the same time, it's a mission for all of us. So anyone in this room can upload a photo, video to our time capsule and have it landed on Mars and be part of the mission. You can watch its trajectory online, see where it's going, and it's your mission just as much as it is ours. And we're going into it. The thing about CubeSats is that they're so small, you have a lot less to worry about. So we understand going into it that we're not going to have the accuracy of a NASA mission, and we're going to have some limitations. Mm -hmm. So for instance, whereas NASA can aim for a 
0.5 degrees off the atmosphere of Mars or a very small window, we'll aim for the center of mass of the planet and say, <laughs> we have a pretty good buffer. <laughs> right. um, so right. there's a lot of things that we're taking into account. And we have some really amazing advisors on board to keep us grounded. So we ha are working with several, several former NASA employees, several scientists at MIT, JPL, across the country. Everyone's been very supportive, notably Duke, where we have several incredible professors that have been meeting with us like three or four times a week. So, so, and, so and there's no landing craft. So this is really um, more like crashing with style in the words of kind of the sto toy story, right? They're yeah. Just kind of falling with style. Okay. So the, yeah, the payload itself is designed to self aerodynamically break. So it only hits the ground at like 20 meters per second. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks for that little snapshot.